I'm Brian Fuller, Editor-in-Chief at ARM, and we're at Embedded World 2023 in Nuremberg, Germany. I'm with Paul Williamson, Senior Vice President and General Manager of ARM's IoT Lab. Welcome, Paul. Well, it's great to be here. It's an exciting show to be here, and just the amount of activity here around the ARM booth and around ARM's products and technology is huge. So I've been in high demand, I've been all over the place, but it's, uh, it's really fulfilling and exciting to be here. So before we get down to business, tell us how you got into technology in the first place. I guess from a relatively early age, got exposed to technology at home. I remember the BBC Micro, which is part of ARM's history itself, yep. sort of in school, and then taking that sort of interest home, um, getting my first Acorn Atom and doing a little bit of coding in basic. So um, sort of early exposure to technology, which then through my sort of schooling, I sort of got more and more curious about what this technology could do, you know, applying computing with Lego models and playing with all sorts of stuff, um, and then couldn't resist it. I've just been hooked ever since, and it's been part of everything I've done in my career. So um, yeah, love tech and have been in there from an early age. So you've obviously seen a lot in your career. Tell us one piece of technology you couldn't live without. It's tricky. I mean, the easy one that everyone says is the smartphone, but actually, um, sort of, I, I think moving beyond our smartphone, which is so ubiquitous, um, just seeing how that functionality is now showing up in other devices. And, you know, I'm a big user of now smart home technology, so I have two things that keep my family household sane while I'm away traveling, and that's a, a smart robot lawnmower and a smart vacuum cleaner. And it um, just means that I don't have to sort of get the mower out as soon as I get home each week. So but that's a great asset to have now. Good for the biceps. Yeah. So you're now back uh, in IoT and ARM. You were running client for a while, but you started out in IoT. Tell us how you got into this industry in the first place. Yeah, no, it's been a bit of a transition. So I actually started in engineering consultancies, and uh, I was working on a whole range of product areas, a lot in medical, uh, also industrial, motor controls, things like that. Um, but then got into the semiconductor space um, and joined CSR, which was a sort of growing startup at the time in the Bluetooth sector, um, involved in selling that on eventually to Qualcomm but saw a lot of change and growth there in bringing connectivity into IoT for the first time. And one of the real sort of pivot points in the industry was the integration of Bluetooth low energy into the smartphone with the sort of iPhone 4S, I think it was. And, and that sort of suddenly made it possible to have these connected IoT devices that could communicate data through your smartphone. Um, and then move to ARM, and here I've seen it blossom through to sort of the the thought of interconnect connected devices that connect directly to the cloud and that's becoming a real reality now we're seeing cloud connected devices everywhere that's that's becoming really possible so how what other kinds of transformations have you seen you've talked about connectivity that was obviously huge yeah. to advance IOT what else yeah, I think the one that's sort of uh, emerging now is sort of more capable devices that are offering more compute to the developer and sort of abstracting some of the hardware complexity as the software workloads are getting more and more complex. So, you know, increasingly seeing RTOS uh, being a standard now, a lot less bare metal development, um, up into greater use of higher performance devices. So microprocessors, A-class in ARM terminology, um, CPUs being deployed with Linux into IoT is a much more standard function now. So that greater compute performance and more abstracted software development is definitely a key theme at the moment that's transforming it. I could be wrong, but I get the feeling that development now, maybe for the last few years in IoT, is starting to mirror development in the mobile space 25, 30 years ago. Can you talk about that? The mobile space certainly was very locked to the hardware for a period of time, and the sort of 2008 smartphone introduction did move us to app stores and software being abstracted somewhat from that hardware you know, in a container of kinds that you then could make use of these key functions. And there is some analogy to what's being seen in sort of IoT in both consumer and industrial, that people are now able to bring you know, workloads like say uh, vision or voice or sound into those environments but not have to sort of tune very specifically to the underlying hardware. So around the ARM booth, we're seeing examples of awesome partnership, awesome innovation. 
what's caught your eye here and around the show floor? Yeah, I think there's a couple of really interesting demos sort of off this way, looking at uh, vision as a uh, key capability. So vision in IoT is becoming the new key sensor platform. You just have to think at how much more you can achieve with a single camera bolted onto the front of a car park and um, can you know, identify all of the vehicles that enter and leave through the day rather than sort of bolting a sensor to every parking space in that building. So the, the capabilities of the platform are so much greater and it's di diverse applications are just fascinating. Over on the demo here we have Hymax, uh, an ARM partner, and they're showing they started in sort of face detection for unlock and access to products, but they've moved into looking at eye tracking and gaze detection and they're able to see sort of newer applications coming forward of, in retail or in um, uh, sort of the logistics industry about how you can use uh, vision to identify shelf capacity and uh, the movement of people within buildings and environments. So it's suddenly unlocking a whole new range of capabilities within IoT. And amazingly, they're pushing more and more ML out to the edge and endpoints. That's right. So Hymax have actually integrated a dedicated neural processor from ARM called Ethos. Um, so that's the Ethos U U55. And that allows you to offload these uh, inference workloads to a dedicated piece of hardware in the SOC. Uh, that means it can run real time with very strong capabilities while still running that sort of flexible software environment on the Cortex-M on the platform. So it just gives you, you know, you know, a massive uplift in machine learning performance of the platform, but also keeping that consistent software framework that you need to develop. We can't talk about IoT without talking about security, yes. uh, which is a big issue. Walk us, walk us through how you're thinking about that, how the industry is evolving there. Yeah, no, security is a really fascinating area. I think, you know, we introduced platform security architecture sort of last time around that I was in IoT, so it must be nearly five years ago now, and it's ARM's attempt to build a framework or an architecture to describe the capabilities of a device and how they map on to mitigating different security threats that are out there in the industry. Um, it has different levels and different classifications based on what the capabilities of the device are and the needs that it has. And so um, we see that being very timely. It, it may have been launched some time ago, but you know the world's waking up to the security challenges if you're going to maintain a device in the field for 25 years. So we're seeing regulators now come in and align with platform security architecture to ensure that when people are rolling this stuff out, out. They're rolling out something that can be maintained and kept secure for the long time. Let's talk a little bit about the role of software and how important that's becoming to accelerating time to innovation. You have a pretty funny story about putting that sort of power in the hands of somebody surprising. Yeah, perhaps I do. I mean, I look for inspiration everywhere, but you know, sometimes it's closer than you expect. And at, at home, uh, I have a 14-year-old son. And uh, while supported by me, he's, uh, he's sort of found his own curiosity and interest, particularly in lockdown, in sort of experimenting with software development. And he started very much as sort of web and cloud, but has sort of jumped down into deploying it onto dedicated hardware. And with, uh, you know, with ecosystems like Raspberry Pi, he's been able to take that enthusiasm and do incredible things, bringing smart vision cameras together with something like a Raspberry Pi and actually building uh, home projects. And so, you know, he's done everything from a, a bird box so we can see sort of birds sort of fledging in our, our garden through to um, his recent project actually, he's building a pinball machine with actuators and sensors. So, um, but he's doing all of this from a sort of cloud first perspective and he's grabbing code examples, he's learning from the web and he's using modern tools and flows without really knowing that that's what's happening and without thinking about the hardware platform he's going to deploy on until much later in the game when he wants to make it work. So it's just been fascinating to watch somebody coming from a completely fresh perspective to code development. So last question for you. IoT is really seems to be coming into its own. In the early years it was very promising. Journalists wrote a lot about it, but it was highly fragmented. 
and now that fragmentation seems to be shrinking because of standards. Can you right. walk us through that a bit? Yeah, I think that's very true. So, you know, I think we've already sort of mentioned that both the software is increasingly the larger part of the equation in IoT. Um, stacks are more complex, the, the range of software you need to deploy is more complex. Um, and then really the choice of hardware is increasingly following the software constraints that you have. Um, and that software, because you need to manage security, you might need machine learning, you might want to use containers even in a richer, more capable software platform. So I think that has sort of changed things significantly and the tooling's coming along to match that. So there's demos here from uh, GitHub who are showing how you can then plug in with ARM virtual hardware, so not needing the developer board itself to be able to sort of develop your code ahead of choosing the selected hardware and to have a continuing integration. Um, and that means you can take tools like Kyle MDK, Visual Studio Code, um, you know, plugins and, and work with tools like GitHub to make sure that you don't have to leave your developer flow, but you can still optimize and target against a huge range of devices. But to make that true, you need common underlying APIs and frameworks. So at ARM, we work on things like trusted firmware and our Simsys pack that allows you to know that you can address the core capabilities you need for your software in a consistent way across multiple platforms. And that, that just unlocks the potential for the developers to innovate, focus on their value add. Well, I know you're a very busy man here okay. in Embedded World, so we're going to let you get back at it, but thanks so much for your time. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Brian.